Drink your lunch. Uh, this is uh, 1922. Uh, so the string girlash experiment, it was basically an experiment in which people were investigating angular momentum and uh, the relationship between uh, orbital angular momentum and spin. And, you know, we'll talk about that later, but I want to talk about a particular uh, case of it, which is a special case in, in which the uh, atoms being examined are silver. And what makes silver special is that silver has a single spin, so it, it has a, a, a... It will only take one value for the angular momentum. And we'll, we'll talk about this later in the class. But for now, just kind of follow me, and uh, it will make sense over time. So the way the experiment is set up is you've got something over here, and this is really a hot oven of some metal. And in our case, it's going to be silver. You heat this up to the point that the silver starts to evaporate, and it goes off in all these different directions. And most of this you, you block off, but over here, so we have some type of blocking which holds it in place. And then over here, you set up a set of collimators, which are essentially a set of uh, you know, sheets with holes in them. I don't know if you've ever seen this in uh, X-ray diffraction equipment or not, but in front of your uh, X-ray source and your detector, you've got a series of these uh, uh, either lead or tungsten sheets and uh, a, a hole. So this hole basically allows passage of a thin beam of the metal atoms. Now, you'd think, you know, the atoms interact with the air and then whatnot and bounce around. Uh, think of this thing done in a vacuum. So essentially, you have a beam of atoms that are going forward. Now, on as they go forward, they're going to pass through a magnetic field. And we set up this magnetic field, have some south pole and a north pole. And when you do this, you set it up so that the north pole, or one of the poles, has you know a little skew to it, right? So I'm drawing this as kind of a a wedge shape, and that's because it's important that the uh, magnetic field have a gradient. So I've got that, and when these atoms pass through that gap, they then are going to come over and they're going to splatter on the screen. The question is, what happens to the atoms as they pass through this, uh, this magnetic field? Well, the force on a magnetic moment is equal to the gradient of mu dot e. So, uh, in my notation, I use a little squiggle under the uh, under the symbol to mean vector. So you'll see this all through my notes. Uh, historically, it's because people use typewriters, so you didn't have a little little uh, uh, top uh, arrow. Uh, and for me, it's just because I, I was raised by a physicist, and you know, in our home, this is what we did. Uh, this mu, uh, this mu is the uh, uh, is the uh, magnetic moment of atom. That is the magnetic field. And this is gradient, so it is d, dx, d, dy, d, d 
Z. And in vector notation. And what we expect is we expect that these atoms, which kind of look like blueberries, will all have random magnetic moments. And if you have these random magnetic moments, then what you're really expecting here is you're expecting some splatter of atoms that are kind of centrosymmetric. So this is going to be our uh, distribution. And this is going to be the z direction. So I should point out that this is z. And that's what we expect. Uh, because we know that we're essentially looking at the z component here. So the force in the z direction is going to be equal to d by dz mu b or fz is equal to mu z and b e z dz. So that's what you're expecting. So we got that, that gradient. And uh, you're just thinking that whatever component this vector has in the z direction is going to tell you how far it deviates the splatters. Uh, but that's not really what we see. What we observe are two discrete lines that do this. And that's observed. And this is expected. So that that was uh, you know, the surprise. And as time went on, people looked for different metals. Silver special because you only get two of these. The others have many different uh, combinations of state components, but we're just going to talk about silver for now. Now, uh, it turns out uh, the magnetization is tied to the uh, angular momentum. And if you want to think about that, you can think about, uh, you can think about you know, the Biot-Savar law in which you had uh, a loop with a current, and you put current through a loop that gives you a magnetic field, right? And if you think about an atom, and you've got electrons that are zipping around, you essentially have a magnetic field. And one form of angular momentum is this orbital angular momentum. The second is called spin. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get more into atoms, but you should know that it's an intrinsic magnetic moment associated with electrons. And in the case of uh, silver, we just have the spin of, of one valence electron. And we're saying that uh, the spin is a vector quantity, and that means you have and add x, a y, and a z component to your spin. So when we're looking at this screen, we're getting an sz measurement of sz is equal to and h r over 2. That's the value you measure, and you'll see where that comes from later. And this sz is equal to minus h bar over 2. And just in 
speaking, we would call this spin up and the spin down. So what it means, this observation, is that uh, the spin is quantized. Instead of being, well, it is random, but it's random in which it can still only take two values. So in fact, 50% are spin up and 50% are spin down if your ion beam is truly random. So, is that okay? Okay, so we have spin, we have spin quantized, we're able to measure it and say spin up or spin down. Uh, so let's simplify this picture. And we'll say that I have some way to you know, move the beams around, and I'll have a, a box that does the measurement for me. So I've got a beam of silver coming in, I've got a box, <clears throat> which I'm going to call SGZ. So this is the uh, is measuring the Z component of spin in my stern gerlach box. And what comes out here is up and down. And of those, I have 50% up and 50% down. If I take this and I take the up box and I'm going to put you know, some block here and block it so I only keep the down and I take that down beam, I put it into a another SGZ, what's going to come out is up. 0% down 100%. So if I measure the Z component of the spin and then I immediately measure it again, it stays as I measured it. So that's, that's good. That you know, obeys our uh, intuition. But we can take this and we can change the results by, say, you know, rotating our box. So we can turn it from being an SG Z box to an SZ Y box. And if I make it an SZ Y box, then I'm measuring the Y component of the spin. And what I find is up, down, 50%, 50%. And that kind of makes sense. I mean, you think about it, it's just kind of saying that uh, I measured the Z component, and then I measured the Y component, and, you know, after I determine the Z, I, I now have a Y component, which is, is uh, commensurate with, with uh, you know, half of those being uh, leading Y direction, half, uh, in, the, in the up direction, half leading in the down direction. Now, the place where it, it becomes strange is if I take, now and I, let's say I'll block the down box, the down. I take the up, and I'm going to put this into an SGZ, and what comes out is 50%, 50%. And this is the first place where we really run into a surprise. And it's, it's uh, from a classical perspective, it's like taking a, a, you know, a crowd of people and having them you know, separate, you know, the uh, men on one side, the women on the other. And then 
uh, you go to the men and you say, okay, uh, I want the left-handers to go to one side and the right-handers to go to the other. And then you go to the left-handers and the left-handers are now half men and half women. Right? We lost our knowledge as we made the measurement in the y direction. And, and this is what uh, makes quantum, what people call you know, weirdness to quantum, because these measurements are, are no longer uh, can independent of each other. So to kind of step through what's just happened, foreshadowing what you're going to see uh, shortly, uh, we would say that S components are incompatible and by incompatible it means that we can only know one component at a time so we can measure we can measure the x component, or the y component, or the z component, but when I measure each of those, I lose the information about the others. And then that's actually kind of a interesting thing because you know you think about this as a vector, and each part of the vector can't be known at the same time. So uh, that's you know the term we would use to describe those components. And say at you know, this point, we would say the S Y components are in a superposition. of S Y equals plus H bar over, or I say it was H bar over, my memory's awful, uh, H bar over 2 minus H bar over 2. So superposition is, is a technical term and it has a statistical meaning that we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, from a practical perspective, what you should start getting your head toward is that we're saying that it has the probability of being either up or down. Uh, and the, the book, you know, In Search of Schrodinger's Cat, I mean, that whole book is about, you know, superposition. And they, they make a lot, lot of it because our natural intuition is that an object is in a definite state of up or down, uh, but getting along in the quantum world means that you get rid of that, and instead you just accept that a superposition is another way of existing. Again, as I say, you know, quantum, people make a big deal about it being weird and spooky and whatnot, uh, and it is if you're not willing to, you know, just realize, oh, the, the uh, the duckbill platypus you know, has venomous, uh, venomous claws. If you just accept that this is how quantum works, you'll see that it's actually a very well-ordered system and, and it makes uh, a lot of sense. Uh, now, another component is that we made a measurement and when we make a measurement, we say that the wave function collapses to a definite uh, state. Collapses.
right? And in this case, you know, right here, all of the atoms coming out of the up box, we say the wave function has, collap has collapsed to the state of being uh, SY up. And for some reason, and we'll, we'll see kind of mathematically how this works out, when we collapse the wave function to the SY state, we lose knowledge about its uh, SZ value, so it goes into a superposition. So I can you know, line these up one after the other, and we go back and forth between being a superposition of SY and knowing SZ, knowing SY, having a superposition of SZ, knowing SZ, having a superposition of SY, and you can just go back and forth all day. 